Adam said, hey, would you come and talk about taxes? And then he left it open-ended. <laughs> <laughs> and to a CPA, when somebody says, can you talk about taxes? We go, huh? This is, what, pitfalls this, this, is, this is what we do every day. What do you need me to talk about? So I sat back and I thought to myself, what do most small business owners, whether they've been in business for five years, two years, one year, one month, or are thinking about starting business, where do they start? What do they do? What do they want to ask? And I just kind of started jotting down several questions that I get asked a lot. I thought, well, gosh, it'd be great to be able to translate that information because honestly, to be able to tell people these answers instead of them having to come in and pay me for the consulting time, that's going to save me a lot of hassle, a lot of time, and it's going to give you guys the power to have better knowledge, to make better decisions. And now when you come in, it's not going to be, Tim, should I be paying estimated income tax payments? You're going to be going, Tim, I need help calculating estimated income tax payments. This is why I think I need to do them. Okay, now the, the conversation has changed dramatically. We're much more focused on what's going on. So one of the first things I thought was, everybody comes in and says, how do I save on my taxes? Let's talk about taxes. Yeah. Can I put a car on it? <laughs> <laughs> the first thing that a lot of people will do is, should I be in a special entity? Should I be in an LLC? Should I be in an S Corp? Should I be a sole proprietor? What, is all of these, what are all these things mean? Maybe I'm already set up because an attorney helped me set it up. Maybe I read online that I should be one thing or another, and I set it up. Did I do it correctly? Am I missing pieces of the foundation? The S Corp one is always one that pops up. Should I be an S Corp? I've heard from this person and that person and my neighbor's neighbor and their cousin's cousin that I should be doing this. Wow, that's a lot of people that said you should be an S Corp. What exactly is it that you do? Oh, I sell products. Okay, great. Let's look at your profit and loss and let's see what your income and expenses are. Oh, it looks like you don't quite generate a profit yet. So where exactly is the S Corp gonna come in and save you anything? Oh, why, I don't know. I was just going off of what people told me. That's fair, but you only get limited information. You're only gonna have limited knowledge. You don't know what you need and what you don't need. So that's usually one of the first things is entity selection. Should I buy something big? Should I buy a vehicle? Like I heard that there's this nice pickup down at Just Ford and it costs about $85,000 today off the lot. And I know that's a big tax deduction. Good for today. Great for today. Not so great in the future when you're making the 12, 13, $1,400 payments for your truck that's your new mortgage. Um, so those are not always easy questions. This isn't a yes or no answer. This is a, it depends. Where are you at in the big scheme of things? Where is your business at? Are you generating enough profit that maybe having a deduction like that's going to save you significant amounts of tax? But beyond that, it can't just be about saving tax, folks. Don't make a decision just because you're going to save money in taxes. Make a decision because your business needs you to make that decision. Is it an investment or is it just for the tax deduction? There's no point in doing it if it's just for the tax deduction. If your normal average tax bracket after self-employment tax is close to 30%, where'd the other 70% go? It's clearly not in your pocket. You're not going to Hawaii, <laughs> but you're driving a really nice pickup you know, you have to really start to analyze the decision before you just jump into the deep end of the pool. And I always tell clients, before you go and do something, if you're at the dealership and they've convinced you to buy something, will you please pick up the phone and call and say, hey, is Tim available? Well, I'm not sure he's actually, will you tell him I'm down at the truck dealership and I'm thinking about buying? Guess what? I'm going to be hurrying off of the first conversation to get back onto that one before you make the decision because we need to really analyze it before we just jump in. Everybody thinks that there are other special deductions or different deductions that only CPAs know about. Well, that's not necessarily always true. We work in this realm for a living. So yes, we know a lot of different deductions and credits and so forth. We understand the flow of a tax return, but there's not necessarily anything special. There's nothing out there that you couldn't have access to by just going to the IRS or going to the Department of Revenue and reading about it. That's what we do. 
we just have a little different understanding of it. We can try to interpret the rules more so because it is the realm of what we do for a living. Um, so I don't want you guys to think that we are some special, you know, God savior about saving you taxes just because we know more than you do. Sometimes, yeah, you know, if it's 20% business deduction and you go, I don't know what that means, but it sounds good because you said deducting 20%. So that, that sounds like two positives to me. Well, you'd be, you'd be right. But that doesn't mean that TurboTax isn't going to calculate it. Like, I'm, I'm not going to stand up here and tell you that I'm better than any software. Software is software. I still use software. I guess I happen to understand where it goes in the software. And as I told one client years ago who said, I don't understand. You just type the numbers into the keyboard, and then you just fill out the tax return. What exactly is it that I pay you for? And I said, here's the keyboard, and here's the mouse. Be my guest. Oh, no, 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 you said it's easy. A monkey could do it. Here you go. That client no longer works with us because it was too simple, he thought. Well, it wasn't so simple. There were a lot of things going on. And because we understood what we needed to do, we understood the progress that needed to be made and the steps that need to be taken. Sometimes it looks simple for us. We can't make it look hard. You don't want to come work with somebody that goes, oh, God, I don't know about that deduction. That, that, looks, that looks tough. I might have to get back to you on that one. I'm going to do some research. Sometimes that's good, but if, if you're that hesitant, that's probably not a good thing. It means you probably don't understand it or you don't really want to know how to understand it. The thing that I've been trying to change in every conversation I have with every client when they come and ask, how do I save taxes, is changing perspective. We mentioned this before. If you make $100 and you go spend that $100 on something to get a tax deduction at 30%, you're saving $30 in tax. The other $70 went into whatever it is that you spent the money on. But you only saved $30, but you spent $100 to save the $30. Whereas you could have just said, I don't really need that. I'm going to keep the $100, spend the $30 on tax, and still remain with 70. That 70 then allows me to make a different decision with my business, especially if that's only $100 and I multiply it by another 100. Now I've got a lot more cash reserves and that surplus allows me to make better decisions with my business. So just changing perspective. All right, let's, let's go into that first one that I mentioned about S-Corps, right? Everybody thinks that they need to be an S-Corp. Adam's gonna ask me after this, should I be an S-Corp? Guarantee it. I don't think I can, but tell me. My understanding is that Pullman Marketing is an LLC, is that correct? Yeah. Oh, well, so LLCs, you don't think that you could be an S Corp? Uh, no, because I don't necessarily want to make myself an employee. Okay. Um, because that allows me more L&I leeway. Okay. So, funny thing about that. So, LLCs can elect to be taxed as an S Corp. LLCs are great for flexibility. I can choose to be a sole member, single member LLC, and the IRS has this neat term. They call it disregarded entity. That just means, hey, we get it. You're an LLC with the state, but for tax purposes, put that over on the Schedule C on your personal income tax return. You only got one return to file. Yeah, you're an LLC, but no, no, we're, we're just looking past that. Just report your business income and expenses and move on with life. You can have multiple members to an LLC. Multiple members, by default, is a partnership. But I can elect to be taxed as an S-Corp, a C-Corp, a nonprofit, association, or a trust. Whoa, I didn't know I could be that. That's kind of cool. Just from being an LLC? Dang, that's cool. What else can I do? Could I just go directly into any one of those other ones? Of course you can. The LLC is just an avenue that can push you down different hallways but you don't have to go those other hallways. You can say, look, I'm going to stay an LLC. We're going to be a partnership with multiple members, or I'm going to be a single member. I'm just going to stay that way. But in Adam's case, he asked, should I be an S Corp? And he said, ah, I have to pay myself wages. Yes, you do. There's a reason why some people like the S Corp is because it's more understandable to them. When they're in an LLC and they want to take money out, they don't feel comfortable with how that works. Hey, I took $2,000 to pay myself. Is that okay? 
of course it's okay. You paid yourself. How do you, how do you pay your bills if you don't pay yourself? Okay, but I just transferred it from my business account to my personal account. Fantastic. Keep doing that. Okay. But how do I pay taxes on that? Ah, great, great question. Well, the only way you can do that is by making estimated payments. You mean I have to take some of that $2,000 and pay taxes? Yep. Oh, well, that kind of stings. But if I was an S Corp and I got paid wages, I can have Social Security, Medicare taxes withheld, and I can have federal withholding withheld and sent in throughout the course of the year. Because you're an employee, not just an owner. Most people understand that. They can understand a W-2 because all of us at one point or another have received a W-2. We can follow the flow, what that means. So to keep it simple, that's one avenue. The next question that you kind of brought up was, well, I don't want to pay labor and industries and workers' compensation on myself. You're an owner. You can be exempt from state unemployment, labor and industries. Even as an S-Corp though? Even as an S-Corp. Now, the funny thing is, you're an LLC. Yep. Remember I said there's a lot of flexibility. You could be taxed as an S-Corp. So what does that mean? That sounds kind of funky. The way you said it doesn't sound the same. It's because it's not. You file an election with the IRS to be taxed as an S-Corp. But the state of Washington, all of those state entities still look at you as an LLC. So guess what? LLC members can't pay themselves wages as far as the state's concerned. So you're not eligible for any of those benefits anyhow. But you still get to pay yourself a wage. You still have to pay the Social Security, Medicare, do the withholdings and so forth, get a W-2. That's because that's what the IRS told you that you had to do. So you kind of get the best of both worlds. Now the real question, what if your net income was $100,000? Would an S-Corp be a good idea? Depends. Or maybe better yet, what if your net income was $25,000? That's more of maybe a typical small business trying to get going. You're just getting started, but you haven't quite got the customer base to develop that $100,000 net income yet. Is one better than the other for an S-Corp? I would argue yes. If you got $25,000, one of the rules about paying yourself a wage is it has to be reasonable. That means it has to be reasonable for the industry and the region. All right, so as an accountant, I should be able to pay myself $24,000 a year, and that'd be reasonable. No, that would not be reasonable. There's no way that the IRS would ever say, yes, if you went and worked for another accounting firm, they would only pay you $2,000 a month. Sounds great. Nope, not gonna let that happen. They're going to say, what's a normal salary for someone that does your work in your industry, in your region, with your experience? Ouch. Well, 24000 isn't going to work. So if you're selling products and you make $25,000, how do I get to a reasonable salary if that's forty dollars or fifty? dollars I can't. I don't even have the income to pay that. I'd be lucky to get twenty, dollars because I still got to pay the payroll taxes on it. So at that level, it probably doesn't make sense to do an S-Corp. But what if you were paying, you know, 100,000 net income? Oh, well, what's reasonable? 50, 60, 70, 75? I mean, I, the number just, just keeps getting bigger. Let's say it's 50. All right, so you make $100,000 before you pay yourself. You've paid all of your employees. You've paid all of your expenses. Now you're gonna pay yourself 50K and you're gonna pay the self, uh, well, it's not really self-employment, you're gonna pay the Social Security and Medicare tax uh, that the business has to match, which is about 7.65%. So let's call that another $3,800. So we'll round it to 54,000. That leaves you with $46,000 of net income. The $46,000 is not subject to self-employment tax. There is no Social Security, no Medicare tax paid on that $46,000 of gain. Whereas if you are a single member LLC, sole proprietor, you'd have to pay Social Security and Medicare tax on the entire $100,000. So you can now understand why people are all saying, oh, you should switch to S-Corp, you should switch. Uh, uh, uh. Calm down, slow down. It really makes a significant difference. 
what if you're that $25,000 person? And you go, well, Tim, what if I pay myself 20,000 in wages or 22, and then I pay the remainder in payroll taxes? Well, then your net income is zero. You saved zero dollars on social security and Medicare tax. You just did it through a different route. You paid it through wages instead of paying it on your tax return as self-employment tax. The numbers just shifted where they were. They didn't shift the amount. You saved nothing. And to make it worse, now you're an S Corp. You have a separate tax return you got to file. Hi, CPA. Hi. You get to pay me to do it. Mm. That costs more money. <laughs> oh, and now you have wages. So now you either have to pay Gusto, QuickBooks, Zero, uh, or me to do your payroll. You can already see where when somebody comes in and they're borderline, they've got. 60, 70,000 in net income. And I'm trying to figure out how much is this going to save you? But then after you pay for all these extra things, are you still going to save any money? Or is it just not time yet? Let's wait another year and see how things go. Better to do it right than to lose the money. Yes, ma'am. So I'm sorry, I still don't really understand all the terms. <laughs> the most of an S Corp versus an LLC. I mean, I understand I could probably go on DR and see them, but do most small businesses, one-person operations, do they mostly start out as LLC? Is that usually the recommendation? It's, because... it's usually either an LLC or a sole proprietorship. LLCs come with a little different layer of uh, licensing. You, you typically are going to the Secretary of State, you're getting an LLC license that costs $200 and $60 a year to renew in addition to your general business license that you go through the Department of Revenue, which between city and state is 30 bucks. If you're a sole prop, you just cut out the Secretary of State fee altogether. You don't even have to go to them. You're just a business. The reason that a lot of people go to the LLC is because LLC stands for Limited Liability Company. Okay. It is supposed to be a separation between you and your business. So your personal assets here, your business assets under the LLC here. Somebody uh, comes in and sues you because of negligence done by your business, assuming they don't get that tacked onto you, uh -huh. they're able to maybe go after whatever's inside the business, but it protects your personal assets separately. Whereas if you're an S Corp, you're the same. If you're an S Corp, it is similar. It is limited liability, but it's because it's a corporation so there are pros and cons as far as the tax scenarios behind it. Corporations have different parameters as far as what you need to have for setup, what you have to have in order to maintain it, okay. the reporting of it, and so forth. I mean, listening to you, Tim, I don't know how any business starts out without an accountant. <laughs> because, you know, you're thinking, because I always recommend to people think about the whole life cycle of the business before you start. Sure. You know, know how you're going to end, know how you want it to go, and you need people in your team, on your team, you know, accounting support, legal support, the, um, marketing support. Some know, of the, the biggest finance. pitfalls are the costs. You know, you're, you're trying to start a business and you're saying, I have to pay how much in rent? Mm -hmm. I, I have to pay for the products that I may or may not sell. So the money that I spent is literally just sitting on my floor, hoping to get somebody to come in. And if nobody comes in, I'm spending money on advertising to try to encourage people to come in. I'm spending all of this money on all of these different items. Where, where did I even get any money to pay myself? I haven't yet. So then it comes down to that final question of, okay, I made a thousand dollars after all of this stuff. An accountant's going to cost how much? An attorney's going to cost how much? And so that's usually the biggest barrier is they go, I can't afford to just take money out of my own pocket to pay this other person because I just don't see the benefit. The hard part is, is when you're first starting, like I said, 25,000, yeah, there's not much I'm going to be able to do that someone else couldn't do. If, and like I've had people that come in and they go, so you're going to save me a lot of money, aren't you? I'll do my best. And then you get done with the tax return and you go, you had three W-2s, a 1098 for a mortgage that I can't deduct because the standard deduction far outweighs being able to itemize. So really, three W-2s. You could have plugged it in for free online, mm -hmm. or you could have spent 100, 150 bucks at H&R Block, 
And those are the types of folks that call and we tell them this. Look, we're happy to work with you. However, it doesn't make good logical sense for you to spend that money with us. As a financial advisor, I would just be a hypocrite by telling people, yeah, come on in, I'll do it. You got, you got two, three, four hundred bucks in your pocket? If you've got a business, it can be, but it's not the entirety. And that's, that's something a lot of people misunderstand. Hey, I went to the accountant and the accountant charged me $400 to do my tax return. Why was it $400? Well, they had minimum fees and then I had a business. So they put it on a Schedule C. Okay, great. Sounds like you did pretty good then, 400 bucks. Well, next year, your tax return, you go, hey, I spent 400 bucks. I paid it out of my business account. Yeah, how much of that was for your personal return and how much of that was for your business? Well, my business paid for it. That's not how the IRS sees it. <laughs> there was a tax court case back in the late 70s where a gentleman said, I should be able to deduct the entirety because the only reason I even went to the accountant was because of this business. I can do the rest of the return on my own. Kind of funny because it was the late 70s. Things weren't quite as expensive as they are today. Um, the tax court judge said, you know, I agree with the taxpayer. The reason they went to the accountant was because they needed help to do the business. But that preparer still had to prepare the basics. How much is that valued at? How much would you have paid somebody to have done this that you could have done yourself? Well, why would I do that? How much? 50 bucks. 50 bucks it is. So $50 is not deductible. The remainder was. Funny thing is, is that that tax return in those days cost $75. <laughs> that was fought in a tax court. That's ridiculous. But that still stands today. So when we go through, we can easily look at something and allocate. All right, it's got to be at least 75 bucks, at least, for just the simple 1040. And you didn't have to even think about it. That's got to be the minimum. Then anything remaining could still be deducted. Back in the days, you know, before the new tax law, we used to be able to deduct it in two different spots so we could deduct the entirety or at least try, but not so much anymore. All right, you didn't want to do the S-Corp. You're going to stick with the LLC or the sole prop. You owe taxes. How do you pay them? Estimated income tax payments. People get really agitated over this because they don't understand them. Like, why? What, what's quarterly about it? You said they're due on April 15th. <laughs> June 15th, September 15th, and January 15th. I am really confused about the whole quarterly thing because the dates don't make sense. Well, there's a little story behind that, but I'll, I'll just skip forward and say that agricultural lobbyists are very, very good and saying, hey, most of our people that are renting out farmland don't get paid until after September 1 because that's after harvest. So we should expand the fourth quarter, which means we need to give that four months, not three. And in order to do that, we have to take one month away from one of the other quarters. So they decided to do it in the second quarter. <laughs> April 15th, what else is happening in April? I mean, nothing, right? You don't, you don't have payroll taxes due. You, you don't have property taxes due, at least in this state. You don't, oh, you don't have income taxes due, do you? No, we'll just file an extension. <laughs> Smart <man. laughs> now you got to pay your first quarter for the next year's taxes. Yeah. So on April 15th of 2022, you would need to be making your first quarter estimate for 2022's taxes while still trying to pay whatever excess you didn't pay from 2021 and still pay all those other things by the end of the month. Sorry, April's not a very fun month. Wait until you get to October. It's just as bad especially if you file the extension and don't file until October, and then owe interest and penalties on top of the tax that you would have paid back in April. There's a reason why we always make these suggestions. Hey, do you want to owe $10,000 on your tax return next spring? No, because I'm not going to have it. Exactly. Let's make the payments now throughout the year. That's all withholding does on your W-2. Now you just have more control over it. So how do you determine what amount you're supposed to pay? Well, there's a safe harbor method. Safe harbor meaning it's a simple calculation. It's got two prongs. 
First one, you're going to look back at last year. Why? Well, because I have a tax return. I can actually look at an actual number. I don't know what this year's is going to be yet because I haven't done it. It's not finished. But I can look back at 2021, even though 2022 is still ongoing. How much tax were you supposed to pay in total in 2021? 10 grand. Great. Divide by four. There's your number. 100% of last year's tax. Doesn't matter how much tax you owe this year, as long as you paid at least as much as you owed the prior year, you're safe. No penalties. Now, it doesn't mean that you might not owe more come next spring. It just means that they can't penalize you for underpaying. So that's a real simple method. Anybody can calculate that number. As long as you have last year's tax return, you can divide by four. And if you can't, there's calculators. So, you know. <laughs> what if you don't make the first prong because you didn't pay 100% of last year's tax? There's a safety net. Did you pay in at least 90% of the current year's tax? Well, I, I don't know. I haven't done this year's tax return. How would I know? You're going to know next spring. So I need to be paying in at least 100% of last year's. Yep. Okay, Tim. All right. You seem to think that you're so smart. Last year, I owed $0 in tax. And this year, I started a business. And my business is just killing it. I've already made $50,000 in the first half of the year. I'm probably going to make 100 k How much tax do I have to pay in? You said you didn't owe anything last year, right? Yep. You don't have to pay in anything until April 15th. But Tim, I told you I'm going to make $100,000. Yeah, I don't care. How much money did you make last year? Well, not enough. I didn't owe any tax. Exactly. They can't penalize you on something you didn't know was going to happen. Now, would I suggest that you make some estimated payments? Of course I would. Because by the time you get to next year and you owe $20,000 or more, you're not going to be very happy about it because you won't have it sitting in a savings account. I, I promise you that. You might have 10, but you won't have 20 or 25 or 30. The numbers get big very quickly, very rapidly. So trying to defend against it. Estimated tax payments are going to help you with that. They won't be perfect. Oftentimes people overpay and sometimes they underpay. We're just trying to use the methods and the tools that we have available to do the best that we can. There's no perfect answer. I talked about paying yourself, but I still get that question a lot. How do I pay myself? I'm an LLC and I have heard you have to keep things segregated. Business, personal, do not commingle. Yes, please, God, do not commingle. It is a disaster. There is no hard rule at the IRS that says that you have to have separate accounts, but it sure makes things a lot simpler when you do. What is your top recommendation for businesses starting out so that, that they don't commingle? <laughs> if it's not 100% business, then I probably wouldn't pay it out of the business account. So you set up a business account, start, start with. I mean, some people want to do that, right? No, no, they do not. So. <laughs> Even if it's just going to the bank and saying, look, I'm doing business as Tim's flower shop. Yeah. Great. Put that on there so that it's very clearly defined. This is Tim's flower shop's bank account. When I get the bank statement, it says Tim's flower shop. And it might have my personal name on it because it might be attached to my social security number. I, that's fine. It's just identifying what it's for. That way, income that you make goes in there. Business expenses come out of there. It's very clean, very simple. You can reconcile it. And trust me, from an audit perspective, if you can't reconcile something, huh, that ain't going to pass audit. It's not going to pass the sniff test. So this is more for the recording. Um, you're saying to have things not commingled. So then is PayPal, Venmo, or Zelly an appropriate amount of segregation? <laughs> That's a fantastic question. And the unfortunate answer is it depends. So with a lot of those, you can have a business account and a personal account. Why would you want to have two separate ones when you could just have one and it'd be so simple? Well, if you get audited, how do I know what the difference is between what's personal and what's business? I don't. So if you said that 
one thing was business, well, maybe they're all business. Prove to me that they're not. Oh, well, I can't really prove it. Well, then you just lost that part of the audit. Or worse, expenses. Maybe I pay people through PayPal. Oh, but I also paid my buddy for tickets to go to the comedian last night. And I also paid my parents for the plane ticket to go to Orlando for Christmas. Oh, sure looks like you have some personal use in here too. How do I distinguish between the two? How do I know you didn't just pay this person because they're your buddy from high school, but they're an electrician. I don't care what they do for a living. I care the fact that you knew this person. Show me the invoice. Well, I, I, can, I can provide the invoice. Yeah, but now you have to provide all of the invoices because I can't trust a single thing out of this account. Whereas if I have them segregated, it's very simple to defend. We tell people have one business checking account. You can have a savings account. That's fine. And if you need a credit card, have one. Do not have personal on it at all. The moment you have personal, it's commingled. None of your business interest is business interest. It's personal. It's not deductible. So you just lost all of the benefits of having the credit card, except for the points that you're apparently going to get that you can use on air miles or, you know, cash back. Oh, except the cash back, if it's business, is income. They're treated as discounts on whatever it is that you purchased. Most people don't know that. They think, oh, I just got this money back from Costco. I'm walking into Costco thinking I'm getting that TV, man. <laughs> yeah, that's business income. You got to pay taxes on that. But I bought a TV with it. Yeah, that was a distribution or a draw that you took. So that's not deductible. Oh. But Tim, I saw a TV in your office. Yeah, it's my monitor. I use it as a monitor. You could check. I bet there's probably a log somewhere to see how many times has he logged into Netflix or YouTube TV. Zero. I don't have time for that. So that's, that's the kind of thinking that you need to go into this. How do I segregate? Now, as an accountant, I'm always looking for opportunities. How can I deduct something that you're going to pay money on no matter what, but some of it's business and some of it's personal? Because I just told you, don't pay it out of your personal or out of your business account. Cell phone. Well, we all have cell phones. Mine's sitting over there because we're having a fight. And she's not very nice right now. So how much of that is deductible? Well, how much do I use it? Most people would say, well, gosh, Tim, I mean, I run credit cards on it. I check my email on it. I go online and look for orders. I'm making phone calls. Okay. How often are you using it personally? Well, I don't know. I talk to my parents and I talk to my buddies and we text back and forth. And, okay. That's, that's fine. Do you have any way of tracking it? Yeah. It's called the phone company bill. They can probably figure out pretty quickly, like how much time are you spending calling people that's business versus personal? That's a real quick, simple way to do it. What if the amount of time you spend talking to friends and family on that phone is so small that you're like, Tim, it's just, it takes me longer than it seems worth. I spent 5% one month talking to my parents and nobody else. The other 95% of the time it's work. Well, that sounds pretty de minimis to me. Probably going to take the whole hundred percent, but that was only one month. Let's look at a bigger swath of time to make a better determination about how much is business, how much is personal. Now, how does that work? How do I, how do I get that on my books, Tim? You said that I need to pay for all my business expenses out of my business account. It's called a reimbursement plan. You're going to reimburse yourself from your business for your phone usage. You might have to reimburse yourself for internet usage. You might have to reimburse yourself for business use of home or mileage, unless your business owns the vehicle that you're driving, which it most likely does not because I could check your title and see what the name on it is. And so could an IRS auditor. There are ways to get deductions that are 100% legitimate, but you're spending the money on and you're not even thinking about. I can't tell you how many CPA practices I've seen stuff come back through very big firms, very smart people. And you look at it and go, where's this deduction? Where's this deduction? Well, they don't do bookkeeping. 
okay, did you just not tell them? No, they said, give us your business books. We'll prepare the return. We'll be done. What's not on your business books? All of those things that we just rattled off. So they didn't deduct any of it. Or worse, they didn't know any different and they ran all of those things through their business account and all of them were deducted even though they weren't all 100% deductible. That's the other side of the story. You can see it on both sides. So that's the difference between the way that we try to do things. We do enough bookkeeping in-house. We can try to relate to a bookkeeper's perspective or your perspective than more of the day-to-day -day stuff. How does this work? How does this parlay through this? And in a lot of cases, a lot of CPAs don't even touch anything except for annually. They'll look at the books and that's it. And that's done. There is nothing more. That, you know, if you ask them a question about what's going on on, uh, on this particular set of books, like how did you get this number? It's not their job. They're not going to ask it. They honestly, in some cases, they might not care. How often are people getting audited these days? We haven't seen an auditor. Oh, that's not true. I saw an auditor come up from Boise. That was two years ago. We did two mail-in desk audits, both from 2017, before the tax law changed. And they were both, one of them was related to mileage the person was taking as unreimbursed employee expenses, which when we saw the mileage log, we thought, yeah, they're gonna lose. There's no chance. So we just kindly put in our response to the auditor, the mileage log is attached, period. Did not bring up anything about how we thought it was gonna be one way versus the other. We sent copies of everything and the audit was returned as a no change, which really told us the auditors that are available don't know what they're doing. They don't have the experience, they don't have the knowledge they're relying on audit guides that were provided by the IRS that are usually 20 or 30 pages long. And if you're dealing with someone that, sorry to say this, but 25 years old, because I know if I was 25 and that's what I was thrown into, I'm probably way behind on everything. I'm not going to read all 30 pages. I'm just going to flip through and see if there's something I need to know that I don't think I already know. And when I come in for that audit, yep, this looks good. Pass. How about good news, bad news situation there? Very. Uh, at the beginning of the century, the IRS had about 135,000 employees throughout the country. Right now they have about 73,000. So a little more than 50%. As a government person, <laughs> you know, that makes me think, you know, people are, the wrong people are probably getting away with it. I uh, just went to a seminar in Orlando and, um, the speaker for both days of tax, uh, of specific tax, uh, used to work for the IRS, 17, 18 years, and now is getting ready to finally retire from his own practice. Um, he remembered the good old days, but he still has connections with the folks at the IRS. So he pulled up, here are the audit rates from 2019 and 2020, based off of 1040s and partnerships and S-corps and C-corps and trusts and so forth. And we looked at the numbers and we were like, wow, that one went down 55%. They did 55% fewer audits in that area. Jeez. Well, if you have fewer people, it makes sense. Then he said, okay, wait, now this might change your mindset. And he pulled up, All right, let's look at 1040s. And let's look at S-Corps because those seem to be hot topics. What's the income level that the majority of the audits occurred at? Gross income above 5 million. There's not a lot of places in probably on outside of metropolitan areas that are generating $5 million in gross. There are some, I'd take $5 million in gross. That'd be great. I don't even care if I have to pay a million dollars for the tax software. <laughs> I can afford it. No, there's no way 5 million. It's just, it's not reasonable for most small businesses. If you're in Temecula, California, okay, maybe, maybe then, but there's a lot more people. We have 35,000 people, not 350,000 people. So you got to keep things in perspective, but those are where they're going. We don't have the manpower. We need the money. 
Let's target the people that have bigger numbers. Why? Because if they have a 1% error on $100,000, that's a thousand bucks. We barely paid the auditor. They have a $5 million or $10 million return with a 1% error. Oh, that's a hundred thousand dollars. That's worth it. Go audit that one. Guarantee we can find something. Even if it's minuscule, 20, 30, 40 K, no problem. And if they make that kind of money, they're not going to try to fight as hard. And if they do, they're just going to take it from 50 down to 20 and we still win. We'll negotiate. So audit is a, a different realm. Just on that, on that topic, I'm just going to jump around a little bit. CPAs, everybody just thinks, Hey, CPAs, you all do taxes. I have met tons of CPAs that don't even do their own tax return because they don't know how. They perform audits, they do advisory, they do consulting, they work for a big regional firm or a big four firm. That's not their area of specialty. That's not their special area to, to focus on. You start talking to them about a 20% business deduction, they're going to be like, that sounds great. I have no idea what you're talking about. Can you just do my tax return with this K1 and this W2 and here's my stuff for my house? Great. No problem. Oh, but except your K1 says that you've got income from about 13 different states. Great. So you've got 14 tax returns I got to file. No wonder they don't want to know it. They're like, uh-uh. I'd rather go do audit. Okay. So not all CPAs are the same. Just because you have the initials behind your name, what does that really mean? A few years ago, somebody asked, they said, what does CPA stand for? And I said, couldn't pass anymore. <laughs> No. I mean, it took a lot of effort to pass the first time. I don't think I want to go back. Uh, I'm from the tech transfer office here at WSU, and I guess I don't have a specific question other than have you seen startups come from the university and, and any common um, you know, mistakes or, or things that are common to kind of the university environment? startups, so, like tech startups. Yeah, I mean, we've had uh, some startups that have gone through grant funding, specifically for, um, you know, biotech and that type of area. So they're getting NIH grants. So they immediately come in because they know, hey, we've got a lot of hoops to jump through in order to get grant accounting done correctly. Otherwise, we don't qualify for this money. So we've had some of those. We've had uh, a couple of uh, tech startups, or I might not even say tech, but other entrepreneurial startups that have occurred some that are still actually here in the area. And they knew right off, hey, I'm really good at what I'm good at, but I don't understand how I need to keep this set of books. And if I'm going to get investors to be involved, and we're going to go through a series A, where we're going to get big money, venture capitalists, hopefully, to come in and give us money, we need to make sure that our sets of books are pristine. We're, we're going to need you know, at least quarterly financial statements. You know, we got to jump through all the hoops to make sure that any potential investors have the information that they need. So can you help us with keeping up with the books? Uh, when we start hiring, doing payroll, you know, and all, each component of the accounting process. And you know, we've, uh, we've got one right now that uh, my partner actually has taken over uh, that takes hours upon hours upon hours every month. And there's weekly or bi-weekly meetings because we're, we're so ingrained in everything that's going on. And there's so many decisions that have to be made because of the finances that without being able to translate what that means, Hey, you could be a, you know, a brilliant scientist or a brilliant, um, engineer, but if you can't understand what that number means, it means nothing. So yeah, we've, we've had a, a couple. Um, in particular that have, I would say, are on the trajectory to be very successful. Well, and I appreciate that fundraising um, point because we, I've seen some that have jumped kind of to a C-Corp really, really early as a business. And I think it's because they're looking at, at their, their expected growth. Yeah, they're going to Delaware, setting themselves up as a C-Corp, and they know that they're going to suffer losses with these operating losses that are going to carry forward with the goal of, well, at some point, we hope to make money. So those losses are just going to offset later on. And if we're living off of our payroll, hey, we're good. And because we're in a C-Corp, C-Corps are really great for fringe benefits. 
hey, you want a retirement plan? No problem. We'll set that up. C Corp can pay for the entire thing. It doesn't come out of your wages. And it doesn't get taxed as income to you. Well, that's fantastic. Your health insurance? Yeah, C Corp can just pay for all that too. So you can start to see kind of some of the benefits that happen there. But we've also had some S Corps that have been purchased. Um, it wasn't a venture capitalist. They got bought out and merged with some bigger companies. Um, and in both cases, it was a different type of merger. So it was interesting to kind of see what those purchase uh, agreements included as far as cash and, and stock and um, just the overall tax repercussions of it because it is a little different in an S Corp as opposed to a C Corp. So maybe a sidebar, but I'm curious about taxes on like some of the new streams of income that exists. So this thing like, oh, I'm streaming and I get donations or I have Patreon, people are paying me every day. Or Lord forbid somebody paid me in Bitcoin. What am I supposed to do? Bitcoin's fantastic, right? Because it's on everybody's radar. The tax return has a yes or no checkbox for every single tax return. Did you buy, sell, exchange, have any dealings in Bitcoin whatsoever, yes or no? Yeah. Okay, I might have bought and have nothing on the capital gain schedule to report. Kind of seems odd to call it a currency when we're gonna treat it as a capital asset, no different than stock. But somebody pays you for a service, okay? That Bitcoin has a value on that day or when you received it. That is the income that you've received from it. It's not normal income from the stance of they still want you to segregate it so that, that you can actually show like, hey, I got this many Bitcoin throughout the year for the services that I've rendered. Fantastic. But from a tax perspective, if you got a business, it's still the same income, no different than if I paid you in cash or gave you a credit card to run through a merchant processor. So you're still going to pay income tax the exact same way on that. Now, what that does is it creates a basis, a cost in that Bitcoin. So that if later on you decide, I'm going to sell my Bitcoin now because I feel like it's gone up from 19,000 know, per coin to 60,000 a coin, I'm making three times my money off of something that I did once for this one customer that I've only paid taxes on here. You're going to have to pay tax on that growth, but it's going to be capital gains. How long you keep it's going to dictate whether it's short term or long term. Hopefully it's long term because if it's short term, you're paying whatever your marginal tax bracket is. So it's no different than if somebody just gave you the money anyhow. So yes, those things do make a difference. Donations, that was actually the IRS put out a notice not that long ago about things like, hey, what about when I get money through Kickstarter? All right, well, it really depends. Are they giving you money so that they can have equity in your business? Is it going into a business or is it going to an individual? If it's going to an individual, that's a gift. Gifts to individuals are not tax deductible. They're not a 501c3 nonprofit. They don't qualify. Okay. But I gave it to a business because, you know, I think I want to be a part of that business. Did they give you anything in return? Like, did they sell you a product? No. Hmm. What happens at the end of that? They just keep your money? Do you get any kind of records that says that you own X amount? No. Well, it sure sounds like you just gave them money. So you don't actually own an asset anymore. You've relieved yourself of an asset, but there's no such thing as gifting to a business unless it's your own. And if you're inside of a business, you can't just gift to a partner unless that partner happens to be family. Family, no problem. But the moment it's not family, they look at it and go, that sure sounds like a hidden sale. We're not going to allow that. So you can kind of start to see, they really try to break it down in the logical explanations. As much as we hate the IRS, they have to jump through all this bureaucracy. They're just in compliance. They're just saying, this is what the rules say. I'm sorry, but you're not compliant. So that's really our jobs. We're, we're modified compliance officers. Hey, how do we get this on the return so that it works out and that you don't get in trouble, assuming someone ever checks it? And if the numbers get big enough, there's a higher likelihood that it gets checked. Now, the, the other side of that, keep in mind, if you're not doing it regularly, you're not, you know, it was a one-off, that's just other income. It's still taxable, but it goes on the other income line. If you look at your tax return, schedule one, at the very bottom, it'll say other income with open lines. But if you're doing it regularly with consistency, 
and you are operating it kind of like a business with the intent to make money, that's a business. It's going to be subject to income tax and self-employment tax. So it really does depend on the motive behind how you got paid, what you're getting paid for, and does it continue.